Sonia and her about her career and her future directions. Thank you, Sonia. Thanks very much, Azeem. Um, thank you all for coming. It's a delight to be speaking to you today. Um, and thanks very much to Imperial for promoting me. Uh, to make sure that this all works. Um, and hello, Mum. Uh, and the South Asian community in North London. Fortunately, my mother forgot uh, the date, so she's up in the States. Uh, but I appreciate all of you who've made a, a great effort to come from um, Oxford and other parts of uh, the country. Um, I'm very pleased to be presenting Chickpeas of Iron, um, which is on the wrong slide. No. Oh, give it away. There we go. Um, how primary care can influence child health. So uh, all of my work has been driven by the belief that every child should be able to fulfill their potential regardless of the circumstances of their birth. And uh, 50 odd years ago, when I was born in India, being a child was a pretty dangerous business. Um, one in four children under the age of five uh, didn't survive to their fifth birthday. That was 10 times the mortality rate in the UK at the time. Uh, your opportunities for education were pretty limited. There were 42 million children who were out of education around that time. And access to healthcare was pretty patchy and dependent on your ability to pay. And so that's why, uh, something I've never forgotten, and that's why I think that the the fact that my parents in 1969 chose to come to the UK um, transformed my environment and changed my life chances forever. And I certainly couldn't have achieved all the things that I have done um, if they hadn't provided me with that fertile environment in which to grow. Life was pretty tough for my parents when we arrived in this country. We all slept in the same bed. We lived in rented rooms, shared a bathroom, often had to move on for what seemed like spurious reasons. Uh, and my mother worked in a button factory, but they worked really hard and uh, we survived. Uh, and I had access to overnight free education, access to healthcare and many other opportunities. My life expectancy in demographic terms went from 47 to 71. Um, being the hardworking people that my folks were, we soon managed to uh, move and eventually they got me into a really lovely um, girls grammar school in uh, just next to Essex. So I can say that I have qualifications that include being an Essex girl. Um, here is my lovely friend Nikki, who's here in the audience today, looking on from a safe distance. And there's me on a biology field trip up to my eyes in bugs and creepy crawlies. I absolutely loved being at school. I adored my teachers and was completely obsessed by science. Uh, Nikki's dad was probably my first influencer in terms of thinking about a medical career. Uh, he was a local GP in South Woodford and he was a lovely man, had a great dry sense of humor and uh, really inspired me to think about a medical career I accompanied him on home visits. He got us work experience in the local Bernardo's home for children. And he went to Bart's Hospital. And I used to hear him talk very fondly about that. And I thought that might be where I'd like to apply. And he thought it was very amusing because I got offered a scholarship interview for St. Mary's. And there was a great rivalry with Bart's at the time. And I turned them down. There was Peter Richardson at the time. Peter Richards was the dean at the time and um, I took Leslie Reese at Bart. So um, that's Anthony Seaton. And of course, my parents being proud Asians uh, threw a huge party, and I thought I was made up. I thought it'd be plain sailing from there onwards, and that's where the title of my talk came from. Uh, this is my great aunt, Chachi, and she said to me, uh, and I translate, you think you've done it, but you have yet to chew the chickpeas of iron. And it's become a bit of a mantra in our family um, whenever we go through tough times, but I will return to this. Um, 
So off I went to medical school. Actually, I got interviewed, and uh, Leslie Rees, who's now Dame Leslie Rees, uh, asked me when I went to medical school um, if I was in favour of positive discrimination for women. And I said what I think probably most people would say now, which is that we just wanted the same privileges as men. Uh, we didn't want an inferior degree. And I don't think I realised what I was saying at the time, but it's only since the years have passed that I've actually realised that it's been 100 years since Sophia Jex Blake, who's one of the first women to have a medical degree and practice medicine, said the same thing, a fair field and no favour, that's all we're asking for. So there weren't very many um, women in senior positions, although we did have the dean of our medical school who was a, um, a woman, Leslie Reese. Um, and the hospital environment really seemed to be filled with surgeons who felt that perhaps, I think that, that you know, women didn't really have a place in the operating theatre. I think my enlightenment towards a career in primary care came when I spent my medical elective for two months in Borneo. We travelled up the river in canoes. We took some very basic medical kit with us and we visited and stayed with these Iban tribes on the Rejang River. Pneumonia, malaria, diarrheal disease, and malnutrition were the commonest uh, killers in those days. But I think I realized that with quite basic kit, you could give a child a bed net, you could keep the cold chain vaccination going. We took a census count because we wouldn't know about children like this child here, uh, if we hadn't been going up there and measuring them and, and recording them, there was no sort of way of logging that kind of data. Uh, and life was pretty tough. And this child is with its grandmother. And I think some of you can see she's got a large tumour growing in her neck and she refused to come back down with us to the local hospital to be evacuated because there was no one else to look after her child, apart from the rest of the community, of course. But uh, yeah, it was a, quite a tough existence. And I started to realise the brilliance of the NHS with primary care at the centre of it. And that's really uh, what I've devoted most of my research to. So the principles of strong primary care are that it is universal. Every man, woman and child in this, uh, in this theatre in the country has access to health care. There are no charges up front, although we're all paying for it. It is cradle to grave, and that gives us continuity over life course, and it gives us the ability to shape people's lives. It's first contact care, and that means that um, we can't say to patients, come back in three months. We, you know, we have to see them at the time that they're ill, and so our care has to be timely. It's comprehensive, and what I mean by that is that we don't just deal with arms, bodies, legs, we deal with the whole person in the context of their family and their community. And I think that patients really appreciate that interpersonal care. And it's coordinated, sometimes known as integrated. But basically, the GP is the gatekeeper. We make decisions about where you go when, you've, when we've assessed the problem. And that allows us to coordinate care among many different aspects and elements of the health system. And that saves the health system costs. So it was, you're probably wondering who this is. This is Barbara Starfield. She's one of the most influential figures in primary care um, before Harold Shipman. Um, and uh, she said that health systems with strong primary care have better outcomes, lower health costs, and are more equitable. So how does primary care impact on the health of children? Well, I think that we actually start looking after children even before they're conceived through contraceptive care. We look after the fetus while it's during the pregnancy. And when they're born, we give early years care. So we have a preventive program. We vaccinate children. Um, we weigh them. We monitor their growth. And first contact care, when your child is ill with an acute problem, we are the first port of call. 
uh, and increasingly a large number of children as they age are getting long-term conditions. So this is the cradle-to-grave model, and it's actually really more of a cycle because we then see their children's children. But when I started out in primary care in the mid-90s, I felt that some of the science that we were trying to take forward in our consultations wasn't really relevant to my patients. It was created in centres of excellence like Imperial. It was created in Barts, where I trained. But it didn't have very much relevance to the patient I had before me. And so we did the next best thing, which was treat the symptom. And we actually did used to suggest that people would go and take Holloway's pills and ointments, and it was a sort of cure-all. It had a bit of codeine in it and, you know, linked us. Um, it wasn't very scientific. The other problem with it was that we had these old dreadful Lloyd George records, which are these cards where we scribbled illegibly on a blue card for the boys and a red card for the girls. And so doing even basic audit was a really laborious process. You'd have to sort of get the notes out and they'd fall to bits and there'd be another set of notes. Um, but you will see that I have a computer on my desk. And of course, we now live in the digital age. So uh, every consultation, every symptom, every telephone call, every prescription, every procedure, every referral, and every hospital encounter is recorded. And we can now dig into the patient record in, a, of course, respecting patients' privacy and in an anonymized way, um, analyze what's going on. And that's what I've spent most of my academic work doing, is creating birth cohorts from routine data to try and understand what's going on through all of these natural experiments so that it's relevant to patients that we see. So these are the principal areas of my research. It sort of falls into contraception, early years care, first contact care, and increasingly long-term conditions. This is the child health unit team having a lovely time on the river over there. And um, I, I emphasize that it is a team. And we have my lovely PA Pirko, who's in the audience today. She is just as much a member of the team. It's all about the whole gamut of people who help us get our grants, help us administ administrate, uh, and also, of course, the researchers. So all the research I'm presenting to you now is other people's efforts. So we have this wonderful system of primary care, and it's been around free, free contraceptive care in this country since before I was born, before I actually even arrived in this country. So how is it that the UK's teenage pregnancy rates are the highest in Western Europe. It's actually 2 to 3% in teenage women. And in older women, um, the, 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 the rates of teenage pregnancy are, are actually just as high. So here, we've got one in two pregnancies that end in abortion out of the women who are pregnant as a teenager. The other thing about the UK's contraceptive use is that long-acting reversible contraception, which is pills, injections, uh, sorry, it's injections, coils, and implants. The more reliable methods are very underused by British women. And we don't know why that is. It's about one in 10. And in the European Union, it's about one in four women. Now, that means that a lot of women are using barrier methods like condoms and hormonal contraception, which has its own side effects but also relies on women taking it in a reliable way. And over um, a period of years, they could be offered more reliable methods. So when I took my first steps into uh, research, uh, I was lucky enough to get a fellowship almost straight away when I started my practice. And um, we had Pippa Oakshot, who's a wonderful supporter and mentor to me, who helped me with my first piece of research. And she helped me design a primary care survey. I thought I'd like to look at contraceptive use in my practice area. And I was absolutely astounded that contraceptive use was very low in Asian women compared to the rest of the population. It was about 30 to 50%. And these were women who said that they were sexually active and that they didn't want children or they didn't want any more children. And so I thought, well, maybe that's just my local practice area. Maybe it's a glitch. 
So I then went to the Queen of Sex. This is Professor Anne Johnson, uh, who's now Dame of the British Empire. And uh, Anne Johnson uh, led the National Survey for Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, and, which is still going strong. And she very kindly let me have a look at some of the NatSal data, which had some ethnic groups in it. And we were, again, really surprised to find that contraceptive use by Indian and Pakistani women was much lower than the general population, about 25% to or so 20 25% of women not using any contraception at all. This is sexually active women, compared with about 5% of the general population. Um, so, any thoughts on what I did next? Got pregnant. <laughs> so, uh, here I am with my son, Jay, and my mother, Mangela. Uh, and receiving my um, master's certificate from the London School of Hygiene, did a master's in epidemiology. And I learned that from that work that what Spike Milligan said was in fact the case that uh, A, I learned that South Asian women are terrible at taking contraception, and B, that contraceptives should be used on every conceivable occasion. <laughs> so uh, much later, Niat, my lovely PhD student from Burma, um, did a systematic review, and she found that around the world, if you have strong primary care, you have double the uptake of um, LARC methods, the long-acting reversible contraceptive ones that are much more effective. So how do you get GPs in this country to offer long-acting re reliable contraception? Any thoughts? The, the, the idea is you can't just put universal coverage, healthcare, out there. You have to do something. So, what do you do? You're right. You pay them. You pay GPs. And that works. So, what, what Miat found is that, so, to explain, we have, for some years, been incentivized, given financial incentives for, mainly for managing adults' uh, chronic disease. And uh, in 2009, we were given incentives to offer long-acting contraceptive uh, advice to women who were attending for contraceptive care. And I think you can see that you see that, that all the larks came up after that period in time and the injectables. So you have to do more than just put the service out there. But what that study didn't show was whether we got the right women. And we have Richard, who's in the audience, who's a, a GP and who's uh, won a NIHR doctoral fellowship to study whether GP incentives can actually reduce abortion rates. So watch this space. We've got some results coming out quite soon. So I want to talk a little bit about prevention in primary care. This is our sort of second core area. Um, when I started out with my master's, I was lucky enough to be supervised by Azim. And um, I just think I got really lucky because he's been an amazing support to me, absolute rock, and uh, he's always been there for me. But at the time, I didn't think I'd have the long relationship that I have with him. And he offered that I look at the fourth national survey of morbidity and general practice for my project. Um, there was great interest um, from the Atchison report at the time in health inequality. Now, we know that if you're poor, if your circumstances are not great, that you are going to be more unwell. And that's exactly what I found. So I found that I looked at the data and I found that children in social classes, that are the lower social classes, had higher illness rates. Nothing surprising about that. But there was a gradient across um, from minor, moderate, and severe illness. It was across the board, infection, respiratory illness, asthma, injuries, all higher in the children with so lower social classes. But what we found that was interesting there was that actually those children had a lower uptake of preventive care. And not only that, they were less likely to be referred on for specialist care. And I'm really made up about this piece of work that I did, partly because it was one of the first bits that I did, and partly because we published two papers in the BMJ, uh, which I tell my master's students every time. 
Uh, and also because it sort of was proof of um, the inverse care law that Julian Tudor Hart wrote to The Lancet about in the 1970s. He said that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need in the population served. And um, they emailed me last week from the London School and said, could they continue to use this in their course materials? So it's really nice that that's a piece of research that I did at the beginning of my career and it's still useful. Um, and then I had this person. Here we are. That's her. Um, that's my daughter, Nina. And she's in the arms of my dad, and they're both here today, so it all turned out well. But when Nina was six months old, she became really very ill, and she got sicker and sicker, and she really was extremely unwell. And eventually she got admitted to St. George's, and it was an awful time. Um, and the team who saved her life um, were led by this man, um, and his name is... Mike Charland, and he's also sitting here. Um, and Mike um, has been an amazing mentor to me, and he gave me the opportunity to work with this fantastic group which we set up. It's called the ICAP, Improving Children's Antibiotic Prescribing. And um, I think that we should be very proud of the set of series of research papers that we produced together. It felt like we were just having lunch in Carluccio's in Bloomsbury. But actually, um, I think some of the most uh, practical and useful work has come out of our collaboration. Uh, so when I heard that the UK vaccination schedule was actually providing a pneumonia vaccine that my daughter hadn't got in 2006, I got on my bike and cycled down to St George's to see Mike and see if we could evaluate it. And um, with the help from Alex Bottle, who's also here, um, we were able to drill into the hospital episode statistics data. And what we found was this. In the years prior to the vaccine, hospitalizations for bacterial pneumonia had been increasing by 31%. And in came the vaccine that was PCV7. It was active against seven strains of the most common reasons that you'd get strep pneumonia causing pneumonia in children. And in the two years afterwards, there was a fall of 19 or 20%. And if you vaccinate the infant cohort, we were just vaccinating children at the time with a catch-up campaign for some of the older kids, you actually benefit everybody. So here's when the vaccine came in. And I think you can see that in the older age groups, you also see these falls. That's a herd immunity illustrated. But the statisticians who are sitting in the audience will be thinking, oh, it's only two time points. Um, so we had another look a bit later on. And the story was that actually here's the fall. That's pneumonia, and that's complicated pneumonia, or empyema, where you get pus in the lung. Uh, and I've greyed out the pneumonia because we did OK on the pneumonia. But what started to happen after the two time points in 2007 started to creep up again, and up and up and up. And it was just around the time that the Department of Health decided to widen the um, efficacy of that vaccination to a 13 valent strain, because we were getting some replacement for some of the strains that we'd knocked out. And we were able to demonstrate that, indeed, after the wider hitting vaccine, you can then uh, pick up and reduce uh, hospitalizations for pneumonia and empyema. But it's not just hospitalizations, it's about 2% of, of children get admitted for. If you have a vaccine that works, you actually can reduce common things. Now, middle ear infections are a common reason for children to visit their GP, but they don't cause a lot of death and destruction, but they do cause a lot of days off work for parents looking after their sick kids, and they cause a lot of pain. And yes, they do get better, but actually, we think that a pneumonia, va pneumonia vaccine has halved uh, the winter peaks. So one in five children visit a GP for an ear infection, and that's come down to one in 10. It's been a really, really successful and effective program. Um, and Ying Fen, who led this work, is also sitting in the audience, which is very nice. Um, so what we've done was we looked in general practice and we looked in hospital data but what we hadn't done was actually see how long that immunity uh, continued for. Uh, last week, 
we published a paper that showed that actually if you vaccinate your child and they get development checks in the first infant years, that prevents their risk of hospital admission across the whole of childhood quite substantially. Those who miss out on their vaccinations are two to four times as likely to be hospitalised for any reason, not just vaccine preventable conditions. And older children who have asthma, diabetes or epilepsy, chronic conditions, are at much, much higher risk. So they are more likely to be admitted four to 11 times more than the general population. Now that may not seem like a, a lot, but actually if you think that of infants, one in four get admitted to hospital, that goes down to one in two if they miss their vaccinations. So we really need to make sure that we mop that up. There are always people ready to tweet about how vaccination is harming your child. This research shows that not vaccinating your child is harming your child. And I just show you this. So this is Sweden. Infants with complete vaccination have been really high um, since 2000 or so. And we've kind of slowly caught up with that. Um, but yet this year, 41,000 infants had uh, measles. So we need to keep those vaccination rates up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about first contact care. And the way that I like to think about this is a lot of people come along and say, I want to do a project with you. Uh, I heard that you've got data sets. And I always say, well, what do you want to do with it? And I think that the key thing here is to ask the patients, try and sort of understand what questions they come to us with. So if you're not asking the right kind of questions, you're really just trawling through data. So I tried to sort of illustrate this with some of our research. And this has all come from contacts with either my audit group who come up with brilliant questions. Um, and we've got Caroline Oliver, who's my practice partner sitting here, who sort of leads uh, a lot of that work. And all of the questions that I have either come from patients or um, colleagues. So here's Nina again. Um, she's actually faking it here. She's not actually ill. She's not perpetually ill across the whole of childhood because although she didn't get her pneumonia vaccine and, and she's completely neglected by both her parents who are doctors, she does sometimes um, have periods where she is well enough to act. So here she's got, uh, she's an 11-year-old girl with fever and a painful ear in this situation. And that's me in my practice. And that's not really a patient, that's our receptionist pretending to be a patient. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, in this scenario, manage, imagine it, um, mum says, does she need an antibiotic for her ear infection? And what are the risks of not treating her? And obviously there's lots of research around the efficacy of antibiotics. But at the time, there wasn't very much uh, around what the complications, what the complication rates were. So I couldn't say, uh, if you have an antibiotic, this would, be, this would happen. And if you don't have an antibiotic, that would happen in practice. So we had a look. So we used primary care data. And this is the work of Paula Thompson and ICAP. And so I think you can see. So this is the number of children that you'd need to treat with an antibiotic to avoid one case of a complicated ear infection, which normally gets better. So I can say to them, if you're 11, you've got to treat 2,310 children with an antibiotic to prevent one complication. And if you're younger than that, you've got to treat nearly 16,000. And patients say, oh, well, should I have an antibiotic then? And I say, well, what if your child is one of those 2,300 who didn't need the antibiotic? And they go, oh, OK, well, maybe I'll just see what happens then. So. I think that that's a really useful bit of information that we can use in our consultations. But there are views and attitudes to take into account, and there are times where you do need to give antibiotics, not in my family, but uh, sometimes. And if you've got an 11-year-old girl with fever and a painful ear, and you do want to give an antibiotic, um, I need to think, what dose? Well, that's obvious, isn't it? You just look in the guidance, the formulary, and it's written there. So we'll just do that. We are in Imperial, which is the birthplace of penicillin. Alexander Fleming discovered it here. And 
After his death, a man named Mosley, we had to go back to the historical records to find out about the dosing of penicillin. So a man named Mosley um, wanted to give oral doses to infants rather than the intramuscular dosing. And so what he did was he got infants and gave them really, really massively high doses to emulate those intramuscular doses. And he published it in a paper called Place of Oral Penicillin in Pediatrics. And what he said was that the size of the dose must be based on the age and not the weight of the infant, etc. And that was in 1948. And that kind of filtered through. And so the ICAP group published this paper here and it said, uh, in the BMJ, and it said... Dosing of oral penicillins in children, is the rule of halves still the best we could do? So somehow that filtered through, and we were dosing, when we looked at it, the adult dose, so a big child would get, uh, would be a kind of half an adult dose, a small child would be half a big child's dose, and a baby would be half a small child's dose. And we didn't think that was particularly scientific. That last update was 1963. What's happened to the size of children since 1963? So uh, we wrote about it, and then um, not only that, we um, looked at data from four different countries. And this is the work of Mike and Julia Beliki, um, publishing a paper in the BMJ. And we looked at country data with the weights of children, and we found that age-banding children actually resulted in many children receiving doses outside of the recommended range for penicillin. And we concluded that the guidance needed updating, but still nothing. So we thought, well, let's have a look and see what doses are actually being prescribed by GPs. And then the commonest penicillin given to children in general practice, which is where you get your antibiotics by and large, um, is amoxicillin. And the average amoxicillin dose prescribed to GPs um, this is children from 0-1 all the way through to 15, was way under the recommended dose that you see here. So 40% of 6- to 12-year-olds and 70% of 12- to 18-year-olds were prescribed doses below the current national guidelines. So you wonder what they were getting. Was it placebo? Were their ear infections getting better anyway? Or were they actually contributing to antimicrobial resistance? And actually, if they did need treatment, were there treatment failures? And that could be a serious and significant thing. So uh, when we publish this, uh, that's Paul Long, who's one of ICAP members. This is video of that paper. When we published this, the Daily Mail came out in protest and said, doctors should give out more antibiotics. Well, no, they shouldn't. Doctors should give less antibiotics. But when they do give antibiotics, they should give the right dose. So, um, but eventually we got a response, and the BMF formulary committee said, amoxicillin doses for older children will be increased to come in line with EU guidance and due to concerns of underdosing after 50 years. So we thought, has that made any difference? Did it work? And this is the work of Olivia Rann and my colleague, Anthony Laverty. Um, so we took the Health Survey for England data and we looked at inappropriate dosing before and after the guidance change. And I think you can see that the number of children inappropriately dosed in red reduced after the uh, guidance change in 2014. So back to Nina with her ear infection. Um, so mum says, OK, I'm not going to have an antibiotic, but what do I do if she doesn't improve? Shall I take her to A&E? So all the GPs in the room are groaning at this point, and I'm saying, no, through gritted teeth, just get back in touch with us first, and we'll give you some more advice about that. But inside, I'm dying, because I'm thinking, I hope we've got appointments for you. And the fact of the matter is, since 2004, we've seen a big shift. We've withdrawn our out-of-hours care, and that's gone to another provider, so we no longer care for patients outside of working hours, but we've taken on this enormous workload. It's an unprecedented workload that we've got, which has been a shift from what was formerly the care of hospital physicians. But most of it that's incentivized, and a third of our income comes from this, is um, remunerated in the quality and outcomes framework, and that's to manage chronic diseases in adults. And so we've 
wondered where the children have got slightly squeezed out. So uh, Lizzie Cecil, who's uh, my colleague in the audience, where is she? Where's Lizzie? There she is. Um, published this paper. And what she found was that actually around the 2004 time point, there had indeed been a, an 8% rise in primary care sensitive <coughs> hospital admissions among children. Primary care sensitive conditions are those conditions which can be ideally treated outside of the hospital given good primary care. And that was equivalent in that year to 8,500 extra hospital admissions in 2004. So when she published that, it was quite a big response because it was 10 days before the last general election. So the Daily Mail, again, helpful as ever, said, GPs are too busy to see your child because parents are swamping A&E because they feel squeezed out by family doctors. The BMA said it was the patients that were to blame. It was a rising patient demand. Uh, and uh, Maureen Baker, who was the last uh, chair of the Royal College, uh, said any increase is actually down to hospital doctors being very cautious and admitting uh, patients, uh, children for overnight observation. And it was the A&E four-hour target that was driving that inappropriately. So Jeremy Hunt and his colleagues came out and said to us and to everybody, by 2020, we'll ensure that everyone can see family doctors seven days a week, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Sorted. Thanks, NHS England. So <laughs> I haven't got appointments in the week, but I'll go and sit in, uh, in my practice at the weekend. Um, so we thought we'd have a little look at that. Uh, and again, this is the work of um, Lizzie and Tom Cowling, who's here today as well. Um, so sometimes you can't just use the data sets that are sitting around in primary care. You have to ask patients. And we have a GP patient survey. So uh, what this bit of work shows is, so if you look here, this is the GP survey that that asked patients, when you last tried to get an appointment with your GP, how successful were you? And the, we divided the practices up into these bubbles. And the practices down here, 75, 70, 75% of attempts, um, patients were able to get an appointment the last time they tried, as, as they reported. And up at this end, these are the practices where patients were saying that they could get an appointment nearly all the time, 95 to nearly 100% of the time. And you can see that there is a variation. And what we found is that these practices had about 40% of children who visited emergency departments, and these practices had 30% of children who visited emergency departments. That's one in three of their children. So if we leveled up these three bubbles to over here, we could save potentially, if you can model it, 30,000 excess visits in practices below average. That's about four and a half million pounds. But what we also found is that these practices were in neighborhoods with a higher registered elderly and they were in the more deprived neighborhoods. So potentially they had more pressure on their appointments. But would it help to sit in at the weekend? That's what I wanted to know. When we actually looked at the timing of the visits, what we found was that vast majority, there were no weekend peaks like there were during weekdays. Most children's A&E visits were on weekdays after school hours. And in my practice, we have dedicated slots, which we open up on the day just for children. And in many places across my CCG and in other places, they're, they're trialing those. And we need to see what impact that has. In the area around St. Mary's, there is connecting care for children. And that is a really novel and interesting space because what you're getting is pediatricians going out. And we have Mando Watson here. Uh, there she is. Um, two really enigmatic um, people, Bob Clarber and Mando Watson, who've created a model which I think is, is, is spreading across the country where they work with GPs to think about how they can... Uh, not just keep them out of hospital, but actually just provide more useful paediatric care, which is very, very much in need. So I move on to long-term conditions, and I'm in danger of overrunning here. Um, we've done fantastically well on global deaths. It's the healthiest time to be five years old. You're less likely to die 
this year than you ever have in the first time in history. And we work with the Global Burden of Disease collaborators to um, produce some of this work. But what we do need to worry about is this, this blue rectangle here. This is the global burden of disease from non-communicable uh, conditions, done very well on communicable disease and injury. If we're in income level one, which we are here and in westernized countries, this is more like 90% of the total burden of disease. And we're living longer, but we need to make sure that we live better. This is Ola Rosling, son of um, Hans Rosling, who's published a book called Factfulness. He was a very enigmatic epidemiologist who sadly died last year, and it's his work, uh, presenting at the European Public Health Association conference in Stockholm last year. So the way I like to think about this um, is that children are not young adults, but their circumstances as they grow, as they get into their teenage years and in their youth, are actually very different to the lives of adults. And we need to think about, imagine if you're a young person, you have to, you've been diagnosed with a, a, a chronic condition, be that asthma, be that inflammatory bowel disease, be that epilepsy, be that diabetes. You're dealing with being ill, uh, or you're dealing with a mental health problem, which might make you feel ill. But at the same time, you have to engage with healthcare. And at the same time, you might actually rather be partying with your mates. And so all of these things are kind of acting together. And, th and I think that this is where holistic care really comes in. You need to think about all of those things. So I'm going to give you just some examples, because um, when I was preparing this talk, my husband said he'd never talk to me again if I didn't include something about inflammatory bowel disease. Um, not because I'm interested in the work at all. Um, one of these men is my husband, and one of them is his um, doctoral student, Chris Alexakis, who led this work. And we've used some of our primary care data to look at cohorts over many, many years, um, since the 1980s. And we found out some quite interesting things. Um, so for young people, actually, inflammatory bowel disease doesn't work in the same way that it does in adults. It's a slightly uh, more aggressive course. It's a terrible disease. You're, you have no cure, and it afflicts you, and it kind of flares up and then settles down over the whole of your life course. But not only that, we found that um, so it, elderly people do have a, a less aggressive disease course, but we also found that... Um, you have to treat it differently. So if you get in early with treatment within the first year, it can actually reduce the rate of bowel surgery, which is what you're trying to avoid through treatment, um, by 40%. And you do have to monitor them. You have to um, give them these immunosuppressive drugs and monitor them, but it can actually give them better outcomes. We've also looked at risk behaviours. Now, more people with inflammatory bowel disease smoke than in the general population. Uh, about twice as much. The smokers have more flare-ups, but what we found is actually quitting smoking um, reduces your risk of flares. And I, this isn't actually published yet, but uh, it's coming out in the American Journal of Gastroenterology soon. Um, and the jury's out a little bit on mental health. Now, depression in inflammatory bowel disease, like many chronic conditions, uh, is double that in the general population. Um, but we were pursuing a, a sort of hypothesis that actually being stressed might make your gut inflammation worse. And so far, a systematic review, we found that actually it doesn't really do that. But we're going to be using um, our data to look at that uh, in coming months. This is an area which uh, is, is now, we're getting onto intractable problems here. We are dealing increasingly with an epidemic of obesity in the adult population and in children. Um, we published a paper in 2013. This is Jess Jones-Nielsen. It's her work. I don't know if Jess is here today. Um, but uh, bariatric surgery in teenagers, we found in the past decade, has shot up 30-fold. This is gastric bypass operations in children as young as 13. Hospital admissions have risen fourfold and we're prescribing ever more anti-obesity drugs in children. That's increased 15-fold in, in a decade. 
We have a National Childhood Measurement Programme, and it tells us that our children are the most overweight in Western Europe. One in three enter their childhood years uh, as an overweight young person. But we're feeding that information back. And in a um, program led by Professor Russell Viner, who's here in the audience, who's chair of the World College of Pediatrics and Child Health, we found that actually we wrote to 18,000 families and found that the impact of the weight feedback that we're giving is pretty unimpressive. Most of those letters are going straight into the bin and there's no change in diet or physical activity um, other than in some very obese children. And I think that if you joined these elements up with the general practitioner's office, you could be much more effective because we know that brief, structured, office-based advice is effective in adults. Uh, and also, there's some evidence from the states that it's very effective in children if you combine it with these computerized, structured tools. But we're missing opportunities in about 40% of cases. I think that the solutions to the obesity epidemic have to lie way beyond the doctor's office, though. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we need to engage a little bit more with the public and media. And this is the Promise team with Rachel Pryke, who's our nutrition champion for the Royal College of GPs, James Cracknell. I didn't know who James Cracknell was when I was emailing him. It was my son who was kind of looking over my... Um, he said, like, James Cracknell. Um, but anyway, he's the Olympian, and I think people like that can be very effective um, at getting messages, health messages, out there. Um, we need to work with policymakers that can impact and, and create big nudges in supermarket trolleys. Um, it can uh, help with advertising, uh, screen time messages, and the built environment. We need to think much more kind of broadly out of the box with policymakers. I think families themselves, you know, we need to think about how we have power as professionals to take our work out there with families and young people themselves, you know, who uh, are now increasingly behaving in different ways as they grow. Um, there's, a, there's a great opportunity to work with communities. And I think that the jury's out on whether these things are working. School-based interventions are effective, um, I put the Daily Mile up there because everybody says it's a grassroots movement that we should all just be adopting. And I'd be very interested to know your thoughts about whether you think it is effective. It, the Daily Mile, for those of you who don't know, is started by Elaine Wiley, who's a Scottish school teacher, who said every child should run for 15 minutes during their school, um, school day. Um, but I think we can work with schools to think about and evaluate some of these programmes. So the future of uh, research in the School of Public Health, uh, children's health research, is looking very rosy. And um, we are hoping to move to a site in, in uh, West London uh, in coming years. And this woman has uh, donated us £25 million to create a world-leading centre for children's health and well-being in White City. I think you've all got um, leaflets lying around the lecture hall. Um, but it is really a transformational gift. I've met Marek Moen, and she is desperately interested in the community there. At the centre of this donation will be a White City cohort, which hopefully, if, if we get it right, will allow us to invest in the community there uh, rather than just be displaced by Imperial's swanky buildings. Uh, and um, the hope is that we will be able to actually uh, reach out to that community and also will be able to set up a cohort study and follow uh, in much more detail the impact of our health care. So I reckon I've got a few people to thank. Um, these are my wonderful practice colleagues. These are the everyday heroes who go out and see patients when I'm gadding around the world. Um, and they are the picks. It's not just the doctors on the outside. Um, but it's the pixies and elves who come together and, and put everything right. Um, and they really do deserve um, to be recognized for the amazing impact that they do. And it's representative of GPs all around the country. Um, I wouldn't have got to where I am now without really having a massive hand up. So uh, a fair field and no favor. I don't think it was a fair field. Everywhere I turned, 
people were giving me a bit of a nudge. So um, thanks to my amazing mentors, I should just mention the ones I haven't mentioned already, Elia Raboli, who is our um, retiring head of school, but still active, uh, is a giant in the world of epidemiology, and our head of school, uh, Deborah Ashby. Both of these people are literally circling the globe, doing all kinds of things, and yet they have always replied to my emails and uh, made time for me personally. So uh, thanks very much. I have to thank my funders, the NIHR. I've had more than my fair share of fellowships, which seems very unfair. And, you know, I have worked hard, but I don't think I could have had all the training and all the support for over 20 years um, without the NIHR. I don't know uh, where I'd be without them. This is the wonderful Child Health Unit as they are now. And... Um, I've learned from my colleagues on my leadership program to lie on my back with them. It helps you think and it helps you sort of unblock sometimes. So that's what I make them do. Um, and this is, you know, a few faces who've come through my unit and who I believe are the next generation of future leaders. And uh, it's been such a pleasure. And it's been such a pleasure um, supporting them, not just through their research, but also through the other things that happen in their lives, like having babies, which is ultimately one of the most important things that we do. Um, the pleasure of having an academic career is the interaction. And it's the interaction with my collaborators. So we have Zoe Williams, who's a, a gladiator, and Russell Viner that I'm with at the Child Health Festival earlier this year. Uh, Chip Maness in Florida, uh, who's been a great mentor to me as well, has nothing but mentors. Um, the ICAP group, Alex Bottle, my wonderful colleague. Irina Peterson, who's uh, here as well today. Um, this is my husband, Richard, for those of you who are wondering, um, <laughs> who's been very good at um, being a husband, um, but I think he got a bit fed up waiting for me to come home, so I thought he'd come and um, collaborate with me instead and see a bit more of me. Um, Ten years ago, I was really lucky enough to be uh, invited onto the leadership program in Oxford, the Oxford Initiative. Here we are ten years ago, and this bunch of ten individuals, we've got Professor McManus here, you're going to meet in a minute, have seen me through all of my um, last ten years, um, personal and uh, work-related uh, challenges, chickpeas, shall we say, that I've chewed. Uh, and we've supported each other, and pints have been drunk, and punting has happened, and conkers have been picked. Uh, and basically, they're just a wonderful bunch of people. So thank you, all of you. I have, sorry, a few more thank yous. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that I led um, a Silver Athena Swan Award application, and we were successful in 2013. Um, but I put it up there, because this is the Opportunities Committee, Good research isn't just about producing a paper in the Lancet. It's about making sure that everybody who comes through your department and that you build has equal opportunities to flourish, regardless of their specific personal circumstances. And it's just too reductionist to say this is all about making things better for women or better for ethnic minorities or better for poor people. Everybody's it's much more nuanced than that. So knowing who your team are and leading some reforms by consulting uh, about their needs really makes a difference. And I really love this because this is where I come to work. This is our department in this building. Look at their faces. Everybody here isn't just smiling for the camera. They're laughing. And that is how it feels to come to work every day. And it means that we want to be here. So, of course, I have to thank my family, having referred to them so much. There's my mother, my dad, my beautiful children, Jay and Nina, my husband, my mother-in-law holding a flamingo, and family and friends, some of whom are here. Professor Hotop, who's there at the back with most of his children. It's really nice to see you, and thank you all. Um, so, just to close, if my great-aunt were here today, I would say to her, I have chewed the chickpeas of iron. They were delicious, and they've given me strength. And so my one hope is that the future generation will also learn to chew those chickpeas, because that's what makes you stronger. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>
So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Richard McManus. I'm a, a GP and academic uh, from Oxford, and uh, I'm the bit before you get to go and have a drink. Um, and my job is to express um, a, appreciation for um, the talk, the wonderful talk that we've just we've just had. I've known uh, Sonia for about ten years, as she she showed you, as I went from having colour in my hair to quite a lot less. Um, she's uh, outlined the the breadth of her work, starting in contraception, showing how primary care can make a difference. Uh, in children, really elegant epidemiological studies showing the impact of vaccines. Moving on to, to first contact and seeing the effect of what happens if you put extra uh, stress and, uh, uh, and extra workload on primary care, what, what the effect that that can have, particularly in deprived uh, populations. And then moving on now to long-term conditions uh, and uh, thinking about how non-communicable diseases are moving from being a, a, a first world to a third world uh, problem. Also, uh, we've heard about her expertise in, uh, in, in building teams. And I think you can see through all the collaborations that she's had over, over, over her career, that she really is expert at that. And, and people really want to come and work with Sonia. Um, I've seen uh, the number of PhD students and master's students she supervises. It's outrageous, especially for someone who's been part-time for much of her, her career. Uh, and that makes a really big difference, particularly in primary care, where we're not over-endowed with um, a, a profession and b building the future in primary care is really, really important. She's shown her leadership uh, at Imperial, uh, and in particular, as you heard towards the end of her talk, um, leading the effort uh, to successfully gain Athena Swan um, silver. Um, now, it's not, it's, it's not a wedding, but I've had quite a few messages of goodwill from around the country, uh, uh, and also from as far afield as Limerick, Leiden, Maastricht, and Frankfurt, and, and lots of uh, good wishes uh, to, to you, and many congratulations. Just finally, Sonia was very modest, I think, saying that she'd had a fair field and no favour. But I'm not entirely sure that that's correct. And I think it's something that, as a profession, we maybe need to just think about. The white man got his chair in 2009, and we were pretty much peers. And I think we just need to think about why that might be. Finally, I give you the first female chair in primary care at Imperial College, Sonia Saxena.